Okay, we're continuing on. We're just going to work through some simple problems uh, just, just to illustrate um, some values that, that you might get for these effects uh, corrections that, we're, that we've been talking about. And let's take an example where we're at an elevation of 50 meters above our datum or above sea level and ask ourselves what the value of the free air correction would be, uh, just, just to get kind of an, a, a feel for, for the scale of things. And, uh, you know, just start by recalling what our delta G delta R is. As we change our distance from the center of the Earth, we are looking at uh, an effect of minus 0 0.3086 milligauss per meter for every meter. And delta Z, uh, delta R in this case rather, uh, Z or elevation is 50 meters. So the free air term is minus 15.43 milligauss. So in other words, the acceleration due to gravity would drop by 15.43 uh, milligauss as you go up 50 meters above sea level. Of course, we're interested in the correction, and we know that the correction uh, changes the sign. So the free air correction, delta G, is a positive 15.43 milligauss, fairly, fairly straightforward. Remember, we do ignore those terms with uh, Z that we talked about. They have such a small influence on the order of uh, 100 thousandth of a milligauss. We, we, We've left that out of this expression here. Now, if we look at the Bouguer plate uh, correction, we're coming back to this plate formula, 2 pi g rho t. If we just, uh, you know, are, are units consistent, unit using meter kilogram second um, <clears throat> units here, so uh, we're, we're uh, calculating it out straightforward without any conversion our result is going to be in meters per second squared. So we've got uh, the 2 pi g term, the density 2500, and 2500 kilograms per cubic meter, and then we've got the elevation, and uh, that should come out in units of meters per second squared, or 5.24 times 10 to the minus fifth meters per second squared. So if we express this result in milligals, then Remember the conversion for uh, meters per second squared to, mil to milligauss is just we have 10 to the fifth milligauss per meter per second squared, so that gives us 5.24 milligauss. So this is basically equal to 5.24 milligauss. Okay, um, <clears throat> just remember that, and this is often a shortcut that we often use. Uh, we went through the development of this uh, factor here. You can see this 4.193 up here times 10 to the minus 10th. If we're units consistent, we want to get our delta G in milligauss, not in meters per second squared. And we want to mix units. We want to have our densities in grams per cubic centimeter and our thicknesses in meters. We can use this constant 0 0.04193 uh, to do that. And uh, try that out. You'll see that you get, um, you should get, depending on round off, you should get about 5.24 milligauss. Okay, here's another, here's another problem. This is a, a terrain correction problem. We've got that butte again uh, that we were looking at. The butte has a density of 2.67 grams per cubic centimeter. It's 400 meters high above the surrounding, above your observation point, and it has a radius of 600 meters. So the butte, as we're designing it here, it fits into, uh, we're, we're going to kind of squeeze it into one sector of a ring, which has 12 sectors. And because we have these areas here, we're going to let the inner and the outer radius differ by 1,100 meters rather than 1,200 meters. Uh, so we're, we're kind of averaging the, uh, uh, the elevation and extent of the butte to fit in this sector. So uh, these are our inner and outer radii. And uh, 
we're just using a ring formula here. So we've got our outer and inner radii. And we've got the uh, height of the butte here, which is 400 meters. And we have to be units consistent if we're going to you know, calculate this straight out. Uh, with uh, <clears throat> g is 6.6732 times 10 to the minus uh, 11th uh, cubic meters per kilogram second, um, and, and these all in meters. However, we can mix the units uh, and just replace this with 0 0.04193. And so, question is, what is the terrain correction for this sector? We're assuming that we only have everything else is flat in this area. You've got this butte over here. You want to know what its influence is on your observation. Well, remember we have to put, we've got 12 sectors in the ring, so we have to divide this term over here by 12. It's a, it, we're only looking at 1 12th of the ring, not the entire ring. <coughs> so, uh, with this n equal to 12, and then making the substitution here using um, using our, our mixed units constant, uh, we can leave the density in in grams per cubic centimeter. Uh, we've got all of our uh, radii and thicknesses in meters, and we end up with the acceleration due to gravity of should be the sector, just be for one twelfth of the ring. Uh, turns out to be 0.316 milligrams. So with round off, you should get something like uh, 0.32 milligrams or, or so. Now this would be something that you would, you know, it, it depends on the precision of your survey, um, what it is that you're looking for. Remember we've talked about this before. If point if the anomalies that you're looking for are on the order of a milligal or so, you want to get a, you want to get rid of things like this. You want to get rid of uh, uh, topographic influences, terrain influences that that are 0.32 milligals or so. <clears throat> Here's another problem. Um, let's say you're in Antarctica, of 80 degrees south latitude, 120 degrees west longitude. You're standing on an ice sheet at an elevation of 1,100 meters above sea level. The ice is 2,500 meters thick, has a density of 0.92 grams per cubic centimeter, and the ice sheet is underlain by bedrock with a density of 2.67 grams per cubic centimeter. Calculate the free air gravity and the boog air gravity, and we're going to assume that the tide and drift really is negligible or we're just we're just not considering it in, in this problem. So we're going to calculate the normal gravity on the ellipsoid. Remember the normal gravity formula? So we have this, uh, this is, these accelerations are in gals, 978.031846 gals at the equator. And so the free air gravity, we're talking about the free air gravity, not the free air anomaly, <clears throat> is going to be, so it would be a theoretical or a predicted gravity, it would be the normal gravity minus the free air term. Uh, so this only includes the free air effect. And the simple Bouguer gravity is the normal gravity minus the free air plus the plate. So this one contains the free air and the Bouguer plate effects. So we're going to solve uh, first for the normal gravity at 80 degrees. <clears throat> and when we do that, we get uh, that the normal gravity is 983.0607 gals. And the free air, um, the free air gravity would be g sub n minus the free air effect. So, uh, you also have to remember, again, that this is in gals, so your free air effect has to be calculated in gals, not milligals. Okay? Now, if we do that, uh, this is going to be our free air gravity, and we, so we have to calculate delta G free air. Uh, if we do that, um, we get, you should get, 330, minus 339.46 
milligrams. And remember, we're, um, oh, let me back, sorry to back up here, but we're looking at 1,100 meters above sea level, so that would be our uh, elevation there. And if we convert that milligals into gals, remember, milligal is one thousandth of a gal. So this turns out to be 0.33946 gals. So the free air gravity would be 982. We're subtracting this from this. Be 982.7212 gals. The theoretical or predicted gravity referred to as the simple Bouguer gravity, this G sub B here. We've got the free air gravity, we've got the Bouguer plate effect. We're going to be calculating effects in gals. So the delta G associated with the plate, you should get 42.43 milligals or divided by 1,000, 0 0.042433 gals. So what would the Bouguer gravity be? Assuming that we, again, that we can ignore tide and drift. That would turn out to be 982.7636 gals. Okay, just, just a point to take into uh, uh, consideration here. If the ice extends, you know, an additional 1,400 feet below sea level, the extent of the ice below sea level would produce a simple Bouguer anomaly. And the interpretation of this anomaly would allow us to, you know, we, we, could, we could then, based on the anomaly, we could determine how much, how thick the ice was if we didn't know what it was. Uh, so, so that that would be, you know, we'd be looking at that subsea ice as having a density contrast of 1.75 grams per cubic centimeter. That would be the uh, 2.67 minus 0.92. And um, so when we start talking about simple geometrical objects, which we will get into in, the co in, in a few coming uh, videos, then we'll be talking about um, sheets and um, what their influence be, a sphere, what its influence would be on your observation. Remember, we talked about this before. There are lots of simple geometrical objects that make life easy, make interpretation easy, because they're kind of simple back-of-the-envelope calculations that you can make in order to estimate what the possible influence uh, what the possible explanation for an anomaly is that you see, or what the influence would be of a feature that you happen to be looking for. What kind of an anomaly are you expecting to see? So we'll talk about simple geometrical objects and um, how they can be used in the interpretation of gravity anomalies. Thanks for joining us.